welcome to Thursday. Uh, thank you for waking up early. I hope you have coffee. If you haven't, um, run now, please, and come back. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed last night's beer, pizza, and chatting with the experts. I certainly did. And for those of you that went to the Next Center party, I hope you guys had plenty of fun there too. I know I certainly did. Um, never far away from a drink. Um, we have an exciting um, conversation this morning. Um, if you look in your programs, you, will, you are at the right place. The title has changed, and I'll let the speakers explain why. But one of the things, the rash, rationale behind changing it is, let's hear from customers. Let's hear how people actually put this stuff to good use. All right. So the title of the session now is Solving Business Challenges with Software-Defined Storage. We already had some of those uh, debates yesterday morning uh, for those of you that were able to join us. And so we're going to extend this. This is going to be an important topic. This is going to be a topic that is going to be discussed, debated, um, and diluted, in, unfortunately. But um, just there's going to be a lot of talk in the next three to four or five years about software-defined storage, software-defined data center, and software-defined, frankly, everything. Um, our list of speakers is impressive. Um, Bridget Warwick is the CMO for Next Center. Uh, amongst other things, she was uh, the vi uh, Vice President of Marketing at BlueWark before they uh, sold and actually through the acquisition by HDS. She was at Store Simple, which is now uh, an asset of Microsoft's. So she's got a great track record, including a patent of her own on how to do whole product gap analysis. Um, I haven't sat down with Bridget about this yet, but we're going to have a very long chat about this concept. Thanks for the heads up. No problem. <laughs> um, so some of the customers, we actually have a, on the panel here Mr. Steve Scherer. He spent 22 years at uh, HP in their business critical systems um, before being part of uh, Silicon Mechanics, which is a reseller based out of the Washington State area, correct? Correct. So welcome, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to talking with you. And his customer is Nico Ratnall. Um, he is part of InGrooves, which is a media distribution and administration uh, company. And then lastly, we're going to hear from uh, Doug Stol Solstice mm -hmm. from Van Butt Lines. And Doug, this is your second tour, from what I understand, of Van Butt, li uh, Butt Van Lines, correct? They, they always ask me that. <laughs> so uh, I think by the end of this, it'll be 10 years, so congratulations. Uh, obviously, the second time around was equally as good as the first. But enough from, from me, ladies and gentlemen, Bridget Warwick. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. So let me take a second and, and uh, talk more about why the title of this session changed. Um, because for those of you who have read the conference guide uh, and some of the poster boards out there, you'll see that the, the track really is focused on adoption and use case when it comes to software-defined storage, open storage today. Uh, and uh, originally, the plan was that uh, we would kick this off with me having a conversation with Evan Powell, former CEO of Next Center, now our Chief Strategy Officer, about how the market was trending. In the last well, handful of months, just about every industry analyst has started writing, covering this phenomenon, software-defined storage. Um, and there are precious few data points to, uh, that, that show how far it's penetrated from a market share perspective at this point, but everyone's talking about it and everybody's trying to define it. We heard from several of the presenters yesterday um, some of the parameters from a technology perspective. What is software-defined storage? Um, but at the end of the day, when I thought about a conversation between Evan and I talking about market trends, I thought that is, might be fascinating for Evan and I, but frankly, from the audience perspective, I think it's much more important that we hear from customers who are already running their business on open storage, on software-defined storage. So apologies for the confusion if you came thinking that you were going to have a market trend conversation. I will touch on one or two of the market trend uh, details before I hand over to the far more important people up here with me, which is um, our customers and our partner who are, as I said, running their business today, have been running their business for quite some time. Uh, I think that uh, open storage running in production environments with customers betting their business on that technology and the solutions built from that technology is 
perhaps the, one of the best kept secrets in storage today. Speaking purely from an Accenture perspective, over the last five years, Accenture has built a footprint of approaching an exabyte in data. Much of that production data across all our customers. And Next Center is just one piece of this open storage uh, movement. So there's a lot of people already doing this. And as much as the legacy vendors, storage vendors, might try to say this software defined storage is a new thing, it's a new trend, let's define it together, or let me define it and I'll ship something in another six months. The truth is that real people are doing this today and have been for some time. And perhaps I'm addressing precisely the audience that knows that. Uh, I think we need to get that message out to the broader community. So before I hand over and, and let you uh, listen to real people who are doing real things with software-defined storage, I do want to take a moment and talk about the, the market trend uh, and, and the conversation at the industry level, um, because I think it's an interesting one. I think it marks a departure from... Um, a, de a departure from something that is interesting but not very important uh, to something that is changing the face of the software industry. You heard it in Tarkin's keynote yesterday, the mess of legacy vendors, right? Uh, massively expensive uh, uh, storage systems. Uh, it's open storage and solutions based on it that are going to change this industry. So I am going to start with what some industry analysts say. Everybody's writing about it. If you've read an IDC report or a Gartner report recently, they've all acknowledged software-defined storage. Um, if, if, if you're IDC, you can't possibly call it software-defined storage, though. You have to make up your own phrase, and, <laughs> which is software-based storage, uh, I believe. And if you're coming to the world from an OpenStack environment, I know the OpenStack folks are much more uh, keen to talk about software-led architecture versus that phrase software-defined storage. Frankly, it's, it's all the same, no matter what label you put on it. It's separating the software from the hardware so that we can take advantage of the innovation in both of those worlds and bring cutting-edge technology in the form of a solution to solve the business cases of today. I chose 451 Group as the analyst to focus on just for a couple of minutes. And the quote you see up on the screen in front of you is taken from a report they published in the last three weeks. Um, the one of the good things about 451 Group is that over the last, I want to say, couple of years, they acquired InfoPro. InfoPro has a database of customers that they survey on a regular basis. And they survey them in a very detailed way and gain insight into how technology is changing. The adoption rate of fiber channel over ethernet, for example. And over time, by going back to this pool of customers, paying customers who are putting their money into the trends and the changes in the storage landscape, they can build uh, a fairly good picture of, of what's really going on. Never mind what the vendors say, what's really going on. And this is taken from Storage Wave 17. They've surveyed their storage folks 17 times. Uh, and I find the, the report interesting in light of the topic at hand. So once upon a time, I added the once upon a time bit, our storage capability was dictated by hardware. Vendors made their own hardware. And they put their own chips around generic drives. If you are a customer of EMC or NetApp today, you know that they, they are much more interested in talking about their software than their hardware, but you can't buy those things separately. You have to buy the full bundle. And over time, they have built their own storage systems. Shopping around was necessary, as the hardware could deliver a significant difference in availability and performance, depending on how those vendors built the systems. Over time, though, the hardware differences have melted away. I mean, that phenomenon is the commoditization of hardware. So what does 451 Group think, based on interviews with, a, with their customer base, what do, what do they think is going on now? 
They think that we have reached the point where software-defined storage is a reality. We just need the last few core enablers to reach software-defined. Well, if you look through those bullets, I think you'd recognize that if you were in this room yesterday, we have multiple vendors delivering those bullets today. But the very last bullet is the one that I want to highlight in this conversation, because 451 Group's customers said open source storage software is a necessary component. Not every vendor is going to deliver open source based storage software. But from a customer perspective, 451 Group is hearing it's going to take open source based storage software to deliver on the reality and the business benefit of software defined storage. So let me take just a couple of a couple more moments before I open this up to real people doing real business um, with this technology and, and look at what is this software defined storage? Um, and what is the business benefit? We heard a lot from folks yesterday about how to build software such that it met the need. Uh, and for the most part, those vendors, those, those um, developers, we heard from several developers yesterday, are still building. They're in the process. The requirements are being articulated and they are designing to the requirements. But there is a whole host of folks that have already delivered software-defined storage and people are building their business today. What benefit are they getting from the software-defined storage that is in the market today? So I'll go back to that mess of legacy vendors for a second. Both of the key leaders in the storage market today, EMC and NetApp, define themselves as software vendors. They deliver their software in the form of an appliance. They acknowledge that, yes, they sell you the hardware too, but they're really all about hard, uh, innovation in software. But if you look at the rest of this conference, the rest of this conference has talked just as much about innovation in hardware. Over the last 18 months, there's been phenomenal innovation on the hardware side on the server side. And all this storage software has got to run on something. It runs on servers. And there's been outstanding innovation in servers. But if you look at the hardware that the legacy storage vendors are shipping today, it's not the cutting edge hardware. It's not the latest and greatest flash drives uh, or controllers or fill in the blank. No, they look at a hardware platform, they decide on it, and by the time it gets to market into your data center, it's already aging from a hardware architecture perspective. It's certainly not cutting edge hardware. And by the time they are ready to refresh that platform, it's getting very out of date. They've refreshed their software several times in the course of that three years. But clearly, they're missing out on the innovation in hardware that's going on in the industry. Software-defined storage gives you the opportunity to take advantage of innovation on the software and the hardware side. And I think the customers that I talk to, for them, that is a key reason to look at this paradigm rather than keep buying storage the way they've done it through the years. But it only works if the solutions are capable of addressing what the business needs. It's great that you can separate hardware from software. It's great that you can adopt the latest and greatest cutting edge technology on the hardware and the software side. But there's still got to be the availability, the scalability, the manageability, the performance, all the classic criteria that you use to evaluate a storage vendor. If the solution doesn't deliver on those key areas and more, I know we've all got the standard checklist, then it's still a science project. It's still something interesting that you put in the corner of the lab because you know it's going to get there eventually and you want to educate yourself, but you're not going to run your business on it. The software-defined solutions in the market today are there 
from all those ill at ease perspective. They are highly scalable. They accommodate a variety of use cases. They may be optimized for, they, they may be optimizable for a given use case, but they are capable of addressing a wide range of data sets and workloads across the data center today. Which it is what the customers to my left are going to talk to you about how they have selected a software defined storage solution and how they're using it to run their business. So enough from, from me on market trends. Uh, I know we will hear a lot more from analysts and vendors alike trying to nail down the definition of software defined storage. I would contend that that definition, uh, certainly I've seen a lot of alignment in the last 24 hours at this conference. And I see in the market the way folks are using it today. I think we've already arrived and I think we already understand just what it takes to run your business on this. The benefit being you drive down the total cost of your storage environment but you've still got the flexibility, the performance, the manageability, all those illities that you need in order to let it into your data center in the first place. So with that, I'm going to hand over first to Steve Shearer from Silicon Mechanics, because I keep saying software, but software has to run on hardware. And it takes the right integrator to put the software and the hardware together for a given customer's need and deliver it in the form of a solution. As a customer, you want one person to call. You want one person owning, your trusted advisor, owning the, the issue and working it with your vendors. Steve is one of those people, and I'm going to hand over to him uh, and let him continue this story. Thank you, Bridget. I, I won't spend too much time up here because ultimately what we really want to do is get to the customer use cases, but just a little bit about Silicon Mechanics. Uh, we're a uh, systems integrator headquartered in Bothell, uh, just outside of Seattle, for those of you who might not know where Bothell is. Um, we've actually been a, uh, an Accenta uh, business partner for going on four years now and uh, have uh, really enjoyed the relationship. And what Bridget has said really is true, because software-defined storage um, as a concept is great, but what happens to you, the end user, when you decide that, okay, I want to move away from this thing that was described as mess yesterday, which I really like, the massively expensive uh, storage subsystems. But you know what happens when you go out and, and say, I want to go open, I want to pick some software, and Nixana looks like it's a good fit. I, I like ZFS, I like the functionality associated with the ZFS file system. Um, but what do I run it on, right? I mean, what am I going to, you know, and, and even if I find the right hardware that's compatible with that software um, and I load it and I get it to run, what, what happens when I have a problem? Um, who do I call? Um, and, and that's where we come in as an integrator. And I'm not necessarily pitching Silicon Mechanics. What, what, we're, what we're doing is pitching the partner community. Uh, what we do as a whole, as an ecosystem, as an Accenta partner, is come together to take this world-class enterprise software, deliver it on industry standards, standard but certified hardware that we rigor rigorously test and as new things become available one of the key things that Bridget had mentioned is we're constantly attempting or trying to stay ahead of the curve for example um, just you know, there's a, a new product coming out very soon from Emulex called Skyhawk that we're extremely excited about and we're actually going to get some advanced uh, some advanced um, units of those to actually begin testing on it's basically it's an all-in-one card it's going to do 40 gigabit it's going to do 16 gig fiber channel um, you can actually do four 10 gig links off of the single port. So these are the types of things that we're going to be adopting into the platform as they become available. And most importantly, certifying them against the software and then delivering that to the end user as a turnkey appliance. Um, and hopefully Nico will be able to articulate some of his experience around what it's like to be able to work with an integrator, not only in a pre-sales consulting role, but also in a post-sales support role. You know, not having to worry about who am I going to call when I have a problem. Um, I'm just going to call these guys and they're going to fix my problem, and if it needs, you know, back-end support from Nixena, then I'm going to look to them to engage Nixena on my behalf. So, um, with that said, what I'd like to do now is introduce uh, Nico Retnia. 
And uh, Nico is the, uh, uh, well, IT director, you know, I think you changed your title recently, mm -hmm. director of systems engineering. But anyway, Nico's the guy that put it all together. When, uh, for, so first of all, I think it would be helpful if you could tell everybody, what does InGrooves do? You know, what's the business yeah. model? So InGrooves is uh, basically a music distribution company. So not a lot of people have heard about us, but we are the middleman between music label and online retailers. So if you are able to get music on Amazon or iTunes, it's usually because we uh, made it available to these online retailers. So in a nutshell, a music label would send us their latest album of their latest artist. And then from this point, when we receive it, we will make it and send it to the online retailers. So Amazon, iTunes, so every online retailer need a different metadata information, music format, and everything. So we receive the content from the music label, treat the information, and then uh, send it to the online retailers. And so uh, because of the business we do, uh, we need a lot of storage. And so wh that's where Silicon Mechanics and Nexenta uh, comes in uh, for us in terms of uh, storage need. Yeah, and when we first met, and, and you know, Ingress has been a customer of Silicon Mechanics for quite some time, yes. you know, buying, you know, just um, all the way back to just hardware RAID, right? I mean, you know, yeah. there were some hardware RAID subsystems, some, you know, it, but they, they were migrating towards some open server architectures. Um, but they... But when we first met uh, Nico and just started talking about storage a little over a year ago, um, they t they were a true mess. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> they, they were uh, an IBM XIV shop with some NetApp front end, you know, um, IBM Blades uh, Blade centers, you know, some very very expensive inf infrastructure. And the the conversations first centered around uh, Gluster, I think, right? We were talking yes. about so so talk a little bit about what the driving yeah. force behind that was. So what happened is um, we. We started as a small company and back in uh I would say back in the day for the soft, software defined uh, storage that really did not uh, exist and so we went with a mess system um, from uh, NetApp and uh, IBM. And so uh, as we grew, uh, we realized that as a medium sized company, because we are not a big size company like Bank of America, for example, or any other type of company that can afford to, to get big storage system, we we, um, we needed something that will drive us our cost down by a lot to continue to make actually profit. And that's really when the discussion started to, to happen because we even were using a Windows storage uh, server as a, as a back end to try to lower cost down by building our own uh, cluster system. And so it was not a true scale out system. And so that's really when we started to look at what was out there, so we looked at uh, Gluster FS. Uh, back we um, looked at even build maybe so, uh, something uh, on our own, and uh, we've also um, discovered uh, Nexenta. And so that's when a partner like Silicon Mechanics come handy because usually when you work with a partner, they know pretty well your system, and so they can tell you, all right, this is what you have, but then this is what is available now, and um, they presented us uh, Nexenta from their experience doing business with us. And uh, that was really the, the, the key point here is that they knew already what we had in the past, uh, even if it was uh, IBM and NetApp product, and that's what drove us to um, work with, uh, with Silicon Mechanics. Thanks. Yeah, and, and um, you know the, the you know the NetApp IBM N series, and, and it's actually back ended by some very large and very expensive IBM XIV systems, which which frankly are very good. You know, I mean, I'm not ever going to stand in front of a customer who's bought a NetApp or an XIV and say that it's not a quality product. And but but the fact of the matter is, is that we're able to do what those systems are doing at a fraction of the cost. I think I've heard numbers that you've thrown around where you've ran out some numbers about what the cost savings are today. Yes. So if we compare. So talking about number NetApp and I, IBM XIV solution uh, versus uh, Nexenta and uh, Silicon Mechanics uh, Super Macro uh, solution, we were up to 70% um, cost down um, in terms of, uh, of actual usable, uh, usable space. 
uh, because we talk about a lot of raw space, but at the end it's the usable space that is the 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 real uh, real number here. And so uh, yeah, we drove our, our cost by a seventy percent seventy percent down. And so yeah, and and what I'd like to do now is um, we had uh, Nico was good enough to put together an architectural overview. This doesn't include the legacy stuff. This is basically everything that we've implemented just within the past year. So that's the other thing that's been really exciting is that we've been able to move this. Uh, into production, um, and this is uh, you know this is tier one. This is not just you know we didn't just put in you know an archive solution that basically is a backup target. You know it's uh, tier three type 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 hardware. Um, this is running tier one production data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let Nico talk a little bit about and step you through his diagram that he's put together. Basically, we just implemented we're implementing our fourth system that's going into Dallas, and we're going to do DR to the three systems that exist right now in San Francisco. And I'll let you kind of step everybody through the architecture and how it's evolved. So, yes, like quick, briefly, so we use NetApp and IBM XIV in a past because we have legacy uh, application. And the, the, the key here for us was to be able to continue to run those legacy application, but then also move forward with new technology like so. Uh, so for different storage, but the SDN and the compute processing and building the environment that we need to be really uh, the key agile because we are really going into the IT being a service for the rest of the company. And um, what we really tried to do uh, in the first place was actually so um, put the, the cost down quite a, quite a lot. And so in actually even uh, less than a year, we've uh, deployed quite a lot of, uh, of Nexenta to, to replace our, uh, our environment with uh, NetApp and, uh, and IBM. And so uh, the data center Center one is actually our main active uh, colo station. That's where we we run the actual uh, business. And so th the key for us was to really uh, find and deploy a system that way we will be able to store the music content because we are a music digital company and we need to store uh, music, uh, metadata information, jackets, and all of that. And um, music business usually you get content but you never you know delete any content because you artists create new music but you still sell some every Elvis Presley for example or, um, Michael Jackson um, music and so we keep getting content as we get more labels so the business is trying to get more label on one side so we need to be able to continue uh, continuously ingest data and so the goal for us was to really find a solution that was incremental cost. Because when you get a system like uh, IBM XIV NetApp or whatever other monolithic big system you have, usually you are um, you need to follow the directive. It's like, oh, you need to at least get this amount of data. So let's say 160 terabyte all at once, because that's the way it is. That's the way the system is. And you cannot just say, oh, but I just need like a couple of terabytes because it's a small label that is sending me all its content. And so um, the advantage of a system like Nexenta was to really uh, put incremental costs so where we just plug hard drive if we need to and we have just a few uh, a few hundred uh, or just a 10 terabyte solution available and that was one of the driving points for us also is really being able to run on whatever we need and add storage space uh, as we we need. And so the advantage of Nexenta here for us was to really be able to run our legacy application, which is uh, at the bottom on the data, data center one, which pretty much run out of SIF. So it's um, our application that get the, the music and encode all this music was actually uh, running out of uh, SIF because uh, in the past uh, that was what we um, we mainly like do and because also we have users that still need to access this content, those music to listen to it and uh, make sure it is good quality. And because of that, we were trying to find a system that will allow us to run the legacy application, but then also build our own private cloud to really uh, give a, a service. And so 
that's where Nick Center came in and we were able on one system pretty much do all at once. So NFS, fiber channel and uh, SIF. Because with system like IBM or EMC, Isilon EMC, or usually in the past you had a, one protocol and then if you need to deploy multiple protocol, you need to buy the license. Or you want to deploy more than one or four volume, you need to buy the license to add multiple volume to, to multiple hosts. And so it was really like, oh, you you were locked in, you would need, oh, you need a features, you need to pay for it. You need a management tools, you need to pay for it. And with Nexena, we were able to just install it pretty much and then you can do whatever you want. It's really just a turnkey solution where I want to do FC, I want to do NFS, I want to do SIF, I want to do WebDAV, FTP. It's there, you just uh, enable it, create what you want, and you're good, to, you're good to go. And so that was really what drove us to, to do that. And the advantage is on one uh, cluster, you can really build the solution you want in terms of speed, IO, so virtualization, usually you will need uh, a lot of IOPS versus uh, story, um, tier two or tier three, where your um, your IOPS are really low, and with the solution with Nexenta, you will be able to choose. Um, like to, um, I need like three terabyte drive, or I need a 15 k RPM drive, and so in one system, you'll be able to plug multiple hard drive to really decide uh, where you want to go, and without the need of oh, I need to buy a system from IBM where I'll just I uh, do low cost storage and then I need a uh, database storage or I need a virtualization system. Then that was the, the main driving point. So we have three systems now deployed in San Francisco actually that do all our need in terms of storage uh, for music content and then we have also systems that support our private cloud that we are uh, deploying. And now what we are trying to, um, I mean, we are actually uh, building it right now, and Bud will um, go further into it, is our disaster recovery through um, auto-sync replication that comes also with Nexenta, which allows us to replicate all the data from actually multiple systems to a DRSI, because uh, the, old, the, the main point is al always to drive costs down, and the advantage is you have multiple systems on one side, and the DR usually is much smaller, you really try to save costs, and um, that's where a system where it's open and use ZFS uh, technology can um, replicate easily to one system to, to, to do all of that. And so the advantage again is that on the DR you can run out everything from one system, NFS, uh, fiber channel, and SIF, and virtualization, legacy application can run from that. And so that's the advantage is software defined uh, storage allow you to really do that and not focus on the hardware itself where uh, in the past you will just, oh yeah, I need to get one IBM XIV, it's 160 terabyte for, um, for some and that's it. It's a full rack, you're stuck with it and you want to you wanna get uh, more space, well I can get half of one or something like that but it's still a full rack that you need to find the space in your data center. It's just, oh I need 10 or 16 terabyte, I'll just plug drive or I'd scale out one or two nodes and that's it. And so that's the advantage of a software defined solution where you just don't care about the hardware. So we work with silicon mechanics, but you can build your, uh, your own, like uh, Bud will explain. And so it's really like up to you after what you want to do. It's really um, open to, to anything. So that's one of the, the key points here. Thanks, Nico. And you know, just to just to um, reiterate, the the top system, the initial system um, that or originally was deployed as 100 terabytes usable, yep. and then you know, shortly after it was deployed, it uh, we added another 134 terabytes to that system. And again, not trying to make a marketing speak, but just people in here are probably trying to figure out, okay, what does that run? Well, 134 terabytes usable is about fifty-two thousand dollars. <throat> so if you do a, a evaluate you know, on a cost per terabyte, that's that's pretty good. You know, you're not going to add 134 terabytes to an IBM. 
XIV for $52,000. And then beyond that, and now we just grew it again by another 67 terabytes. So yeah, total right now we are about half a, a petabyte of actual usable space. Yeah, so we're, we're just shy of a petabyte raw. And uh, just shy of a petabyte raw, about you know five, almost 500 terabytes usable. And again, at the end of the day, usable is what really matters, right? I mean, what we're, and the, see, we have the ability too to deploy exactly what's right for the right application. The initial deployment at the top was was dual parity RAID Z2. You know, less disks, less licensing, lower cost, more of a sequential workload, right? So what we did is evaluate, and that's what we do as an integrator, is work with the customer to define workload, right? So what is it that you're trying to accomplish? We don't want to ever do a deep dive, bag dive, if you call it, on technology, although we love to talk about ZFS, but ultimately what we really want, really want to do is find out what's the business requirements behind your storage, right? What's driving the need? And then what we do then is we take the opportunity to say, how can we deliver this in, in, the, in the lowest cost, but also, you know, the, the, the highest performance, right? You know, again, the right, the right solution for, 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 the, for the need. And what we can do is we can build pools of, of disks, right, based on different metrics. You know, we can do RAID Z2, dual parity again, which was the initial deployment. The, the, the virtualization server that's actually hosting the private cloud environment, the Zen cloud environment, is uh, 15,000 RPM uh, mirrored pairs, you know, 600 gig, 15K drives, you know, for extremely high IOP and throughput, where we're utilizing read and write cache and some of the benefits that are inherent to ZFS. So anyway, enough out of me, but what we really wanted to do is just make sure that everybody understands the ease of which you can expand this environment and, and how flexible it is. And, and basically, we can scale out by just adding pools of disks and, and, and adding to our cluster, making it highly available and delivering a true five nines or better availability to the end user, just like you would with your, you know, your NetApps or, or some of your more traditional storage vendors. So um, that's enough for me. Okay. And uh, I think now, Bridget. Well, I think it. I think it's time for. Doug. It's time for Doug. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the clicks right there. Put you onto your screen. Hi, everyone. I'm Doug Soltes from Bud Van Lines. Uh, Bud Van Lines is a nationwide moving and storage company. And uh, today I'd like to talk to you about being able to do disaster recovery on a budget. So we do software defined everything, right? We run VMware to virtualize our, our guests, we do that on commodity hardware. So, you know, I'm not running Dell or IBM or HP or anything like that. You know, go over to the open server people, you know, I'm using their, their hardware. Uh, for our storage, we're running ZFS, uh, mainly for our VMware environment through Nixenta on, again, commodity-based hardware. And for our end users to connect into our system, we're using Citrix. And you're going to go, well, Citrix is, you know, not open. Well, no, it's not. But it is still software. It enables commodity devices. <clears throat> it enables commodity devices to connect my end users to their environment. So uh, you can pull out your iPad, I can pull out my phone, you can have your laptop or your Chromebook, and I can allow my users to access our environment from anywhere using this software-defined everything um, environment. So uh, a couple of quick things. I'm not going to be able to tell you everything there is about disaster recovery in the next 35 minutes. I wish I could, but it'd be a whole day conference. Uh, I have a ton of links because there are so many different ways to do this and I'm not going to be saying, you know, VMware every other sentence or Nixenta every other sentence. There's a lot of people out there that allow you to do things through commodity. And uh, if you want these slides, it's really simple. I'll tweet them afterwards. Go to doubleparity.com. I created a blog site this weekend, and this is the only thing up there. If you take down that address, it'll take you straight to these slides. And my last note is, hey, sometimes you do get what you pay for. So when I start talking later on, you know, can you do disaster recovery on a budget? Can you build your own sand for, for $100 buying parts on eBay or getting SATA drives? Yes. But you know what? You might not get support. You, you might have should have spent the extra, you know, thousand, few thousand dollars to call silicon mechanics. Uh, you're still doing software to find everything, but you know what? It depends on your resources. Now, I will say, doing everything yourself will give you a lot more uh, expertise in uh, in the marketplace. So, why is Bud Van Lines an expert in disaster recovery? Well, because we've learned through experience, right? Uh, we were headquartered in New Jersey. We've had uh, two hurricanes in the last year, a two-foot snowstorm in uh, October. The trees didn't understand understand that they were supposed to have lost their leaves ahead of time. We, I mean, it just seemed like every other week we had no power for a week. Uh, we do have offices nationwide. I have them in California. I have them in, in Ohio, in Georgia. 
uh, they're prone to tornadoes, floods, uh, gas outages. So, you know, you'd think that, um, you know, some of my sites are okay. Well, I can tell you that after Hurricane Katrina, I had to fly down to our Atlanta office. Uh, around the same time, there was a, a tornado burned off from the, the, the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. So not only was I down there to check the damages, from a possible tornado hit, uh, but there was no gas anywhere. I'm very sorry. <laughs> um, there was no gas anywhere to be found because all the refineries were shut down. All right, so I'm not going to say you can do it in four easy steps. I'm going to say you can do disaster recovery in four steps. And the first step is virtualizing your environment. Then you need to replicate your data to another site. Um, you need to automate this data, and you need to allow your users to communicate and get back into your system. And again, none of these steps are, are easy, but this is what you need to do. So the first thing is virtualization. Now, is anybody here not virtualizing their environment at current? Is this like a new word for anybody? So good. Um, I built this slide myself. This is like my one animation I'm very proud of. <laughs> what I'm trying to, thank you. <laughs> what I'm trying to show here is, hey, you need virtualization in order to have disaster recovery. And you need virtualization because it allows you to move a server, a virtual machine, this packetized object container from one set of systems to another. Now this could be in your own data center. So disaster recovery starts at home. It starts in your core. If I've got a bunch of hosts and they're all you know, running along and one of them has bad memory, I can live vMotion uh, VMs from one uh, server to another. All of my hand-me-down servers go to my California office, which is currently our disaster recovery site, and I can power off a VM, and even though I have Intel in one spot and AMD in the other spot, um, I can migrate them all over what's called cold, meaning they had to be shut down first, and uh, we can recover from that. So let me talk about you know, the first step. If you're trying to do hypervisors on a budget, um, well, you can't really do VMware on a budget. So VMware does have a free product, and we are a VMware shop, and we do pay them a good amount of money, um, but it's kind of worth it. And again, I am using software defined because this is um, software allowing me to have my, my guests running on commodity hardware. Uh, VMware has a free edition, but if you try to use their free edition to do disaster recovery, you're going to be um, really disappointed. What happens is they lock out all the API commands to do things like shut off your VMs, etc. Uh, they also don't give out a free management console. So uh, when you talk about using uh, hypervisors or virtualization to do disaster recovery, you need to have two things. You have to have your hypervisor. That's where all of your VMs are going to run. You also need your centralized management. You could do it by trying to pull all the hosts, but if you've got 100 hosts or 10 hosts, you're going to pull your hair out. You need something like Virtual Center from VMware. You need something like Zen Server, uh, Zen Center. You need that centralized management because you want to send commands to that centralized management that says, shut down my VMs, unmap the storage, move it over to another spot. Um, I guess just a quick question. How many people here are using VMware as the primary hypervisor? Okay. So it has a great API and all library, and we're going to get into that in a minute. If you're not using it, how many people are using Hyper-V? Okay, good. I, I don't know that much about Hyper-V. I've used it a couple of different times. The nice thing is it is sort of free. Uh, where they hit you is on the management. They hit you in the management because you've got to buy System Center, and System Center is the way that Microsoft wants you to manage all of those free hypervisors they gave you. The good news is um, in the free hypervisors, uh, PowerShell works against all of them, and there are a bunch of third-party companies that will give you a free management console. So you can do Hyper-V you know, technically on a budget. You can definitely do Zen, and uh, now Zen has X, uh, XCP, which is their Zen cloud platform. Uh, a lot of people don't seem to know, but Citrix had acquired Zen Server from the UK. They were the first company that came out with Zen and then commercialized a product. It is now completely open sourced. If you're trying to do it on a budget, this is an excellent option. You can go to zenserver.org. You can go to citrix.org. You can download their entire hypervisor platform, including Zen Center, which is a Windows uh, GUI-based uh, management appliance. If you don't want to use Windows, then great. Uh, I gave a couple of links down below so that you can get Linux-based management appliances um, for Zen to automate the whole thing. And if you want to pay money, because again, sometimes you get what you pay for, uh, you can call Citrix still and just pay for support. Just like with KVM, you can pay Red Hat for support. Anybody using KVM? 
Okay. So again, uh, a lot of different options there. They probably have the, the most options. Uh, Red Hat's the big supporter of them. Now with, um, uh, I'm sorry, our friends at Joyent um, using uh, Smart OS. Okay, so you've virtualized. And virtualization, we've already said, is the first step. Why is it the first step? Because if you're not virtualized, you're not going to be able to get these VMs moving from site A to site B or even to, to have that high level of redundancy in your um, data center. Um, when you virtualize, you gain a couple of other things. Uh, you know, going on to our next step is going to be shared storage. So shared storage should be more redundant, should be more powerful than having local storage uh, actually in your servers. You've got RAID, you've got HA, you've got clusters, you've got all this great technology, along with uh, virtualizing your network. So I know that that was a, a couple of topics here, but we have this very expensive HP switch that has two controllers and should never go down, and yet it goes down. So, you know, when you virtualize, you can virtualize your network stack, you can have a Cisco switch sitting below it, or an Arista switch, or whatever you like, and you're able to quickly move things around, or even have the hypervisor do that automatically for you, because it's doing everything with virtual NICs, whereas if you're trying to do this without virtualization, you'd be in there trying to move a lot of wires, which is not humanly possible. So step two is to uh, to replicate. And when you replicate, you're going to need a second data center. I mean, whether that's in the cloud, a branch, or a co-location, um, you're going to need that. You're going to need data access to it. You can do it very inexpensively through uh, VPN tunnels. That's what we're doing. We're doing IPsec over the internet. Um, cable modems, um, and then and, and make sure you get static IPs. That's that's a huge problem. Um, and then you're going to need to copy your critical VMs, and you need to have a, a conversation with your management as to which VMs are really critical, because everybody thinks everything is absolutely critical. Um, where you send your data is really up to you. For Bud Van Lines, because we're nationwide, it made the most sense for us to uh, deploy a second NIC Senta system um, in our branch offices that we could replicate the data to. Um, if you don't have branch offices, maybe co-location makes sense for you, but some of the cheapest uh, prices I found for a single rack was $12,000 per year. Um, I don't know how that fits into different people's budgets. The cloud is interesting. The cloud kind of has a break-even point below 10 terabytes because you got to put your data up in the cloud, and some of the cloud prices are about $100 per terabyte per month. So if you've got 10 terabytes, you're paying $1,000 a month times 12 months, you've got your $12,000 again. But you're only paying for compute when you actually spin up your uh, environment. So however you do it, that's totally up to you. But the point is, you need a secondary site. Um, there are two different ways to get your data over to the other site. So every backup provider is going to sell you something called VM-based replication. It's included with um, Zen, it's included with VMware. They're going to take your VM, they're going to snapshot it, they're going to move it from site A to site B. Well, the problems with using VMware-based replication is it's hard to get a very low RPO. And, and RPO is your Crevly point objective. So at Bud, my management has said, Doug, we really want to make sure that if Bud goes down, that the data sitting in California is no older than 15 minutes. Well, gee, that's pretty hard to do if you're constantly snapshotting VMs, running everything independently. The way we do it is SAN to SAN replication, which is made affordable by open source technology, uh, ZFS, Nixenta. Um, SAN to SAN replication has the problem that you're taking this snapshot of a virtual machine, and the virtual machine does not know you took a snapshot of it. And what can happen is you get this thing called a crash consistent um, image, whereas on the top level, you're not crash consistent. The virtual machine knows you're taking a snapshot of it. On the top level, if you're not using VMware, you got to watch out for this thing called Leaf Coalesce. What happens is the other hypervisors, they take these snapshots, they do their backup, they replicate it to the other side. You tell Hyper-V, okay, get rid of that snapshot. It goes, no problem, I got rid of that hot snapshot. You look on the actual storage and the snapshot's still there, and you go, what gives? And then after like three months of running your software, you have 90 snapshots sitting out there and your whole sand you know, fills up and crashes. Um, it's a leaf coalesce problem. So you need to watch out for that if you're going to try to do the VM-based uh, replication. I'm going to talk today about SAN-based replication because I think that that's the future. I think that's the only way that you can really meet your recovery time objectives. And uh, we use ZFS, and we think ZFS is great. Obviously, there's open ZFS. And the only issue with ZFS is, you know, how do you do ZFS in a production environment? Because you want to make sure that it's certified. I, I don't want to run something that VMware is not going to certify. Well, 
that's where an Accenta comes in. I want something that's HA, um, where if one of my nodes goes down or an Accenta sends me out a patch I have to put on, I want to make sure my entire environment is still running. Um, Nixenta, you know, has HA. You can go to RSF and get HA from them. Uh, there's a competitor called TrueNAS that has HA. Why did Bud Van Lines choose Nixenta? Well, because Nixenta is on the VMware HCL list, and that matters a lot to us. Plus, our production VMs we want to put on um, storage that um, has uh, HA and um, support by, v by VMware. If you want it completely free, which in a couple of cases we do. So I have these video camera systems. Uh, they write hundreds and hundreds of terabytes of data, and we want that to be extremely cheap. Well, we installed OmniOS, or go get FreeBSD, or FreeNAS, or any of these other ones that actually run ZFS. I know a lot of the guys yesterday talked about ZFS on Linux, etc. If you do something like that, there's this free download called Napit, completely free, gives you this high-level management of uh, you know, ZFS, I know that obviously they'd love me to be saying Nixenta, Nixenta, but you know, maybe for your tier one data you're using Nixenta, and for your tier three data like me, your backup, everything else, you're still using ZFS, it's free, it's on commodity hardware, and you're using these people's free tools to uh, you know, run with it. Uh, this is the SAM we built. I'm not going to spend any time on this slide. I just put it in in case people want to go see my slide deck. Everybody was always like, oh, what's your recipe? What did you do? But kind of like Silicon Mechanics was saying, we saved a significant amount of money. I mean, it's like a quarter of the cost of what we had previously from you know, NetApp and from uh, Compellent. Uh, my quick notes, if you actually do build your own SAN, which I'm going to kind of recommend against, I'm going to recommend you use a, a third-party integrator um, because, again, they're certifying the parts, they're doing all the work, they're doing everything for you. You're not going to save that much more money. Sometimes you get what you pay for, but, um, you know, use SAS over SATA. Don't buy parts on eBay. Make sure that you uh, got the HCL list. I can't tell you how many people I go to dinner with and I tell them, ah, oh, you should use Nixenta, you should this, you should that, and they say, oh, you know, I went on eBay and there's this JBot I can get, and I'm like, why do you think it's on eBay? If it's working perfectly fine, yeah. Um, and do you really want to put your job on the line, your tier one data? Maybe that's my video system, I don't care, fine. Or that's my test system, fine, but not my production stuff. All right, so this is the last and most important part. Well, not really the last part. Part four is to communicate. But I've got my data. My data is virtualized. I've replicated it to another site. Am I done? That's what all the backup vendors are going to tell you. They're going to tell you you're done. You call Nixenta, they're like, yep, you're done. You've got your data living in another site. You're not done. Has anybody ever had to fail over to another site? You got all your data there. The VMs are there. Well, what about re-IPing them? How do you spin them up? In what order do you spin them up? You know, these questions. How do I re-register with DNS, NAT? There's all these questions, and everyone goes, well, what you need is a run book, and I agree. What you need is a run book, and if you don't know what a run book is, I gave you a nice link to a wiki there. The only software that I really know of that completely automates the whole thing is VMware's SRM, which is not cheap. And the other problem with SRM is you need to have your storage provider write an SRA for it, and guess what? ZFS doesn't have an SRA for VMware. You need those millions of dollars that mess has in order to have your um, your SRA. So how do we replicate? How do we do it? Well, on our site, I've been given authority to later on put up our PowerShell scripts. We're using PowerShell against VMware. We're using PLink against Nixenta to um, script and fail over. You don't have to be a programmer. This is easy stuff. What you do is you write a run book, and here's a, a quick example of a run book. This is from our you know run book but summarized a little easier. And then you're just saying, script this. You're going to first start your replication to the other site. Why would you start your replication first? Well, because a disaster is coming, a flood's coming up the road, a tornado is on its way. You might as well start getting your data to the other site because odds are, if your power, or your internet line goes down, you may not have time to clean everything up and then replicate. So first, you start replicating because I'd rather have a crash consistent copy at my other site than have nothing, you know, at all. Um, then you're going to power off your critical VMs. You're going to register your critical VMs. Why? Well, because later on, you got to unmap your runs from your host because once I get everything to the other site, I want to start replicating back to New Jersey. So I'm going to power everything down in New Jersey. I'm going to replicate it all 
to California, the last step before I turn everything, anything on in California is to replicate again because if all my VMs are off, well now I don't have to worry about crash consistently. This crash consistency, they've all powered down properly. I start spinning up in California. Well, guess what? If that tornado misses us and it's Monday afternoon and we failed over to California, we will not be failing back from California until Saturday because failover requires downtime. There's no if, and, or but about that. That's your RTO, your recovery time objective. How long does it take you to fail over to your other site? Um, for us, it's, a, it's you know a few hours. It's like three hours, even automated and whatnot because of replication, because of all these these other objects. So if we fail over to California, we need the replication to reverse itself because a lot of data is going to get built up from Tuesday to Friday, and I don't want to try to re-replicate all that on Saturday. I want it to be you know, kicking back. And God forbid the tornado is coming up the street in New Jersey, and I replicate to California, and then like the next day the tornado misses us, but the next day there's an earthquake in California, and I have to come back. Then I might as well just go to the bar. <laughs> All right, so how do you replicate your failover when the only product out there that I really think that is worth paying for is SRM and you, you can't do it with the Nixent and Nixenten everything? Well, you're going to use um, a VM over at your DR site. You're either going to create a Windows VM or a, a Linux VM. If you create a Windows VM and you're using Hyper-V or um, VMware, you're going to probably use PowerShell commands against it. That's what we're doing. You want this VM to be in your DR site because that's the site that's supposed to live when your main site goes down. It makes no use to have this in your primary site. You have to have this VM running and scheduling things from the other site. You're going to write your scripts that say, shut down all VMs that start with the letter you know, D or all the ones in this folder. And again, later on, I've been authorized by my company to put all of our PowerShell scripts once I clean them up and take our IP addresses out of it and put your IP address here on that double parity uh, website. You can also do this through Linux. If you like Linux, you're using KVM, you're using Zen. Um, you can automate your uh, failover through shell, Python, etc. So I've given you just a couple of um, examples with VMware from our you know, run books um, down below. So if you want to know how to do it through PowerCLI, which is their PowerShell, there's the link that, that gives you every single PowerShell command. If you want to do it through VCLI or through Perl, because VMware gives you this free uh, VMA, which is a Linux appliance that you can run everything from. Um, the top command here, like if you want to unmount your NFS data store, because we use NFS through our open storage, um, the top command is how to do it with PowerShell. The bottom command is how to do it with the, the VMware CLI. And again, if you want these slides, they're all online, so don't bother writing this all down. Um, if you're not using VMware, here are the different links you'll need to, to do the same thing with Hyper-V, Zen, KVM, um, to run these things against Nixenta because they have their own kind of console shell when you go into it, or how to do it against a, a pure Lumos-based ZFS system, or BSD-based. All right, so last step, I've got my data. I moved it all over to the other site. I powered it all up. Am I done? No. You're not done. And that's what we ran into you know, during one of the last hurricanes. In Hurricane Sandy, um, so many of our users had no power at their house. So on Monday when the hurricane was coming in, nobody came into work. Everybody citrixed in, rem worked remotely from home. But then on Wednesday, you know, everything's up and running and nobody's in the system. Nobody can make it in because of the roads, um, danger, everything like that, no gas. And all of our users have no power at their house, and we were surprised by the number of user, or end users we have that don't have laptops. So we actually this year started building these disaster readiness kits, which were a Chromebook, which is like 200 bucks, a MiFi, which T-Mobile now give you like 200 megs a month for free. It was like some announcement yesterday, but we got a whole bunch of MiFi devices, which any carrier will give you for free, and you put them on like a $5 plan unless you actually have a disaster in a car inverter so that for 300 bucks we've got these disaster readiness kits. We went to HR, we said who are labeled critical employees, there were like 40 of them, and we gave them all a disaster readiness kit because you've got your VMs running at another site, you have IP'd everything, but how do you get your end users to connect to that? So maybe for you that's going to be um, uh, a VPN tunnel or something like that. The other thing to know is during Hurricane Sandy, we were surprised by the number of people. We shouldn't have been surprised because you have to send announcements all the time out for this. But if your website's down because you're failing over to the other site, because remember I told you to shut down all your VMs before you fail over to the other site, well, how do you tell everybody not to come into work that day? 
use Facebook, use LinkedIn, have a, make sure the employees know that you will post a status to Facebook that they can use from their cell phone to see if the company's open if, God forbid, all of your sites you know, are down because you're in the middle of a failover to your uh, other site. Uh, you know, forward your office lines. There's so much more, you know, that you need to do. Um, you, know, you can use OpenVPN if you if you insist on using desktops in your office instead of thin clients and VDI. And um, if you use VDI, obviously there's Citrix, there's Remote Desktop, there's um, VMware has a product called Vue. You know, all those things are going to allow you to. Um, again, software defined, break the link between that computer at the person's desk and the ability for somebody to use any device and access their compute resources. And that's all. That's that's 20 minutes of, of try to DR your environment. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank you very much. We'd like to open it up for general questions now. I think, is this microphone on? Yes, it is. Questions, comments, thoughts? Yes, Chandra. I have a couple of questions. Uh, also, thanks for sharing your experience. It clearly there's a huge uh, cost savings, and I see the flexibility in the data space solution to tune into your application uh, Did you miss out anything moving from the mass in terms of field of use or product quality? That's one question. And after you answer that, are you a special type of user, uh, like for gaming of people who can play with this open source type of stuff? Or, I mean, who, is, it, is this type of solution good for most of the data centers out there, or, or is there a class of data centers where these solutions are a better fit? So, I mean, I definitely encourage all end users to know the product that they're working with. So when we had a NetApp SAN, I went to the NetApp classes. When I had a Compellent SAN, I went to the Compellent classes. When I had a, you know, I currently have a Nixenta SAN, so I went to the Nixenta classes. Um, I think you have to know your equipment. I definitely think that the bigger companies, the mess, you know, they, they clearly have more training classes. They, they probably have, you know, prettier notebooks. Their GUI looks a little bit nicer. But at the end of the day, the ZFS core is very strong. Um, their core is very strong as well. Um, you know, it just, it, you're saving a lot of money, but it doesn't look as nice. It's, it's the difference between, you know, a Mercedes and a, and a Honda. They're both reliable. They're both going to get you there. One of them costs three times as much and looks a lot prettier, and the leather might feel a little nicer on your butt, but, um, you know, they're both going to work. So I don't think you have to be a special class, but I do definitely believe that no matter what sin you have, uh, I push responsibility in knowing your equipment, and I know a lot of network administrators that have NetApp or whatever have no idea how it works because some third party came in and they've got such an infrastructure that you don't even have to know your environment. There's a third party you can pay to do absolutely everything. Um, and if that's you and you've got that kind of money to throw around, you know, good for you, but we don't. <laughs> Yeah, and your point is, uh, is true, is that we were in this situation where we had a solution with NetApp and IBM that was uh, sold by a third party, and we were in a stem where we did not know much of how it was uh, working, and we know the basics. We had a GUI, nice GUI, and that was working, but then at the end of the day, when you want to really like put your cost down and, and everything, you need to know more about your, your system. And so that's where open source solutions comes in. And also what you were saying about yeah, geeky kind of person or anything, but that's where uh, an integrator is one of the key here for, was one of the key for us where sometimes you don't necessarily also have the money to be able to uh, test a true system where I say, oh, I want to test a system with actual like, you know, 50 terabyte or 100 terabyte of data and, and see how that plays out. And so um, Silicon Mechanics was able to put a system in their lab for us to actual, actually do testing and play with it. And so that's really the key where you get a feel for it and being able to even just download the software and play on just, you know, one new server or, or something to, to get the, the, the feel for it without spending any money pretty much and without signing, uh, signing any Thing. And so you always have, you know, yeah, you always need to look further and see what is out there to to be able to uh, to change your, your path and, and do things. But yes, like, like you said, the GUI may be nicer, but at the end of the day, you know, if you need CIF or you need NFS, the protocol out there, it's standard and 
you know that's that's there and that's working and so you, you may need to uh, uh, to um, to work a little bit more with the goo with the CLI or or stuff like that but at the end of the day see if NFS or fiber channel it's there and that's working and, and just to add to that a little bit um, we have we have different types of customers and you know the ones that we have that 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 uh, run the smoothest are the ones honestly that don't do anything without talking to us first is what we it was which is exactly what we encourage you know we're our mission to the end users to look just like NetApp you know that's that's our role as an integrator is to deliver a turnkey appliance um, where where you know your job as we say your job is to write to it and read from it and our job is to make sure it's available when you want want to write to it and read from it and you know that's where we come in you know and, and you know there's training and education we do a complete turnkey service when we set it up uh, we can do it remotely we do it on site we do training um, and you know at the end of the day it's just a storage subsystem that's talking over some protocol right and if you're familiar with protocols if it's you're familiar with NFS and NFS style permissions and ACLs you know it's no different it's going to be the same type of environment that you're used to if you're setting up ACLs and uh, and uh, permissions and things like that over SIFs and NFS on on any other platform that's multi protocol you know that has a you know both file and block uh, and, and just to, to reiterate on what he said, again, we didn't trust, I got to tell you, we didn't trust Nixenta when we first met them. It sounded too good to be true. I met them at VMworld. They were running the labs. Some other big player in the labs went down, and they kicked in and, and helped the labs run. And it's like, okay, so you've got all the performance at a quarter of the price. I don't really believe you. Well, you can go to their website. You can download the software. You can run it in a VM. We definitely did that. They have a community edition. You know, download it. Take an old piece that you've got at home that, that will work and put all of your kids' photos and, and your MP3s on it. You know, doing things like that will teach you how to use the language. Just like people go, oh, well, Mac's easier than Windows. Well, I've got them both. If you know Windows, Windows is easier. If you want to learn Mac, then grab a Mac laptop and make that your only laptop for a week, and you'll know Mac by the end of the week, or vice versa. So, you know, by using it, you're going to know it. So if you're afraid to present this to your boss, you know what? Build a community edition for home, and in storing all of your photos or whatever you like at home, you're going to learn Nixenta. And if you don't want Nixenta, then go ahead and grab OmniOS or whatever. You know, by using it, you'll know it. Um, and then if you want to make sure that you've got the I's dotted and the T's crossed, go to the integrator at the end. You know, silicon mechanics have them sell you the system, and you've got the training, the familiarity from doing it purely open. Yeah, that's so interesting that you mentioned that, because I, I can't tell you how many of our end user customers started out with an advocate inside the company that did exactly that. You know, I mean, they built a home, they built a home NAS, they put files and videos on it, they stored their music library, and they got comfortable with it, and then they became an advocate for it inside the company. They said, you know something, this can do a whole lot more than just store pictures and, and, and movies and things like that around, around the home. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a, lot, a lot of users, a, a lot of systems that we've sold have come to us that way, where, you, where it's just somebody, not, somebody in IT became an advocate inside the company. Or those home houses make their way to the office and become mission critical. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, I, that's right. I, I, I gotta say this. My home now is more mission critical than his. Yeah. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> I do have to say, and I'm not obviously advocating any software piracy or anything, but the the home NAS that you have. You know, you can do a send receive. So if you start putting actual critical data on it, and then you realize you got in over your head, you know, ZFS has send receive. You can go to Silicon Mechanics, buy a real NAS that say have the right performance to a send receive, and now your data is over there, and you're out of that hot spot. The other great thing with ZFS is the pool is independent of you know everything else. So you know, if right now something happened and my controllers got knocked out and my disk were okay, I can take those disks to a different head running BSD, running all these other things, and import my pool. Um, you know, there's a lot of hey, you build a, a home system and you I, you shouldn't, but for whatever reason you put something critical of production on it. There are ways out, but if you were talking to a mess vendor, there's probably not a way out. Without a lot of money yeah. or, or competition, yeah. Definitely yeah, that's that. yeah, that's another really cool thing about ZFS that that you know that you can pull disks out of a ZFS system in in no in no particular order. You don't have to label. You don't have to do anything. Try that with a hardware RAID setup or another vendor. I mean, you can just pull out. You got 50 disk drives. You can pull out. You know, and those 50 disk drives might represent three different pools. Um, you can just pull them all out. 
in any no particular order, shuffle them if you like, do put them back in, and put them back in in another ZFS system, and it will automatically recognize those disks as part of a pool. And it's a simple one click from the GUI that says import. You just import that pool. And we tested that before we purchased. We we tested for at least six months before we purchased. We have a question over there. Yeah, back. Yeah. So, so in your experience as an integrator or, or even individual companies, you guys find that the choice to go with the traditional CN vendor versus an open solution is more based around the risk aversion than the IP operating shop that's been run. Yeah, I, I, absolutely, uh, and uh, I think that. It, but but back to uh, to what uh, our, uh, Doug was saying is that the best thing to do, and what set a lot of people's minds at ease, is is experiment experimenting with it first, either at home or you know in, in you know in the office. It, there is a download, a free download. It's a 45-day trial. It's the full product. It's not some scaled-down version. We've actually extended trials for customers that are really serious and say, hey, we're coming to the end of our trial. We want to extend a little bit further. If we say, no problem, we'll extend it for another 45 days. Um, really, that gets over a lot of that risk adverseness, right? Because at the end of the day, it really isn't just about saving money. You know, everybody says, what's the value add of this particular solution? And I say, sure, there's money savings, right? But at the end of the day, back when Bridget was talking about, if you remember when she was talking about the hardware and, you know, the cycle and, and when you first get that hardware, it's already old, right? But, it, but not only that, at the, at the end of that three-year cycle, then those vendors are going to come to you and they're going to start telling you what to do with your system in some way, shape, or form by raising maintenance, by doing certain things that actually force behavior. So the decision-making becomes theirs, not yours, as far as what you're going to do in your environment relative to your storage. This gives you complete power and control over that environment. You make the decisions about when you want to upgrade. The license from Nixena is perpetual. Um, some of the obviously some of the other things that were pointed out that are completely free are free. You know, so basically it's 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 up to you now to decide. Do I want this new feature? Do I want this faster processor? Do I need to upgrade? Or am I okay just running it for the next two or three years, even if it's out of warranty? It's entirely up to you. It's, it's really about saving money, but more importantly, it's about putting the decisions around your storage back in your hands and not in the legacy storage vendor's hands. Maybe one more question? Okay. Um, so is uh, in groups, or for that matter, from the actual uh, data is it all spindle based? So yes, at like the we, at the moment we are mainly like spindle or spindle based, uh, especially for the for our storage need where we store music content. Yeah. We don't need uh, you know, fast, uh, fast, uh, super fast system. So it is a spindle, uh, spindle based. Like right now the yeah the 500 terabyte of usable storage space is uh, spindle based. Even our uh, virtualization system with uh, 15k SAS, uh, 15k SAS drive. So uh, later, if we, for example, go with uh, running databases on, on it, because we roll out, uh, we are trying to really uh, roll out um, software-defined storage in our environment, and databases are still running on um, legacy mess uh, mess system. Where and in this case, we um, we have. Um, you know all the type of uh, of configuration with the IBM XIV and SAS caching and uh, and all that comes uh, comes with it. Or black Oh uh, yeah, you know yeah. whatever you you want to run on. But so I can, not, yeah. go ahead. I, I can tell you from our point of view, we really like the whole idea of the the hybrid system, the tiered. So we're running on 7200 RPM drives, and you go, well, that's too slow. But it's not because we've got that L2 arc, which is our SSD, yeah. and then we have the arc, which is incredibly fast. That's our RAM. And my argument is going to be this. Um, I have plenty of big databases. In fact, one of the main reasons we switched to Nixenta, um, we had originally bought the system to do file management, document management, and we started having this monster VM that was a SQL database just killing the I.O. on our compelling system. So we were like, hey, maybe we'll just move it over to the Nixenta system and keep it from thrashing all the other VMs. It ran three times faster there, and then obviously we started putting everything on Nixenta. Um, because, again, we didn't trust them at first. But 
houses. Let's, let's look at a system like email. Um, everybody wants their email to run fast. They all have 10 gigs of, of email. You tell them to delete their emails. They're not going to do it. But what do they really need to run fast? They need to run fast the messages that, they're, that just came in, that they're looking at. The messages that they've kept for five years don't need to run fast. Well, when you start talking about a pure flash-based system, y you get to say, well, this VM runs fast and this VM doesn't run fast. You don't have to get to say, this email runs fast, that email doesn't. So the whole hybrid approach is that things that people are using are getting copied, and I think that's a big difference between some of the other mess providers. Some mess providers are every hour or once a night moving data to flash or blocks. Um, ZFS copies it on the fly because my flash is not as dependable as my storage, as my spinning disk. So I don't want it moved and you, you could lose the data when you're moving it or get corruption. I want a copy there and if I lose my flash, I want there to be no problems with losing that. And I have critical VMs that need a whole ton of IOPS and I make sure that you know I've got my ARC and everything working. But I would make the argument that that's when you need somebody like a Fusion IO or a bunch of these other players that put the flash close to the compute. And so that's what we're doing. We've got in each of our ESX hosts a solid state drive that accelerates the, the databases. It's extremely affordable. It's much more affordable than trying to convert my entire, you know, SAN. Um, but it's a cache. It's a yeah. cache. And, and, right. for, and for those of you who might not be as familiar with ZFS, I know that we, we want to be um, observant of time, but, you know, we have a booth downstairs. We're happy to sit around and talk with you afterwards if you have further questions. We can explain to you how ZFS caching works. It's a very, very cool thing. It really gives us the ability to actually leverage lower cost um, 7200 RPM drives, but still outperform in, in some cases all flash arrays. So happy to talk to you about that. Okay, we should probably wrap it up. We're a little over time. I'd like to just thank the rest of the folk at this table. Thank you so much.